Uh, then it's time to welcome our first commentator of the day. Uh, she is a research director at the um, Research Institute of Finnish Economy, so Elinkeinoelman Tutkimuslaitos, obviously, in Finnish. Uh, she has been the acting professor in, uh, in econom economics at the University of Helsinki and at the Swedish School of uh, Economics and Business Administration. Uh, she has written a great number of articles, reports, uh, and books uh, in the fields of human capital, labor market institutions, and adjustment to, to technological progress, just to name a few. Um, so without further ado, um, please welcome Dr. Um, Rita Asplund. Well, thank you for this very kind invitation to comment on two most exciting presentations. Um, I would say that um, these two presentations complement each other in quite a nice way. And uh, they give a very good overview of uh, what is actually going on in our societies at the moment, especially when it comes to technological change and, uh, and uh, labor market, changing la labor market structures, changing uh, occupational structures. Um, it's, um, this was a very nice review of the ongoing debate, the existing evidence, drivers behind these phenomena and uh, also quite, uh, <laughs> what would I say, I don't know, uh, well, all these uh, opportunities and, and also threats that come with uh, robots and, and um, I think I don't want to be in this world when this, these slaves <laughs> um, uh, handle our robot slaves, handle our, our lives. Um, maybe I belong to the wrong cohort. Anyway, it's not easy to, to comment on uh, such broad topics, but I would like to, to draw your attention to two aspects um, and uh, I also try to be quite brief just to leave as much time as possible for discussion because I, I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that many of you have um, questions to pose to, to the two persons that spoke here before me. So first of all I would like to um, um, say that we have done some research on occupational uh, job changes or changes in the growth of occupations and job tasks also in Finland quite recently as a matter of fact and um, the results actually point to some trends of polarization, some degree of polarization or then no trends of polarization. The results namely very much depend on uh, the way that you approach this question, how detailed data you use and also what kind of measures you use. It is very much a question of whether you use broad occupational categories or whether you go down to quite detailed job task levels. It is also a question of how you group occupations or uh, job tasks into um, income 
groups if you use uh, five quantiles or if you use deciles or if you use more detailed uh, categories of uh, earnings levels. Just to illustrate what I'm trying to say here, I will present you a few graphs based on Finnish uh, data, Finnish results. So um, I guess I need to do something with this. Yes. So this first graph concerns industry and more precisely white collar workers in, in industry, Finnish industry. Here we have used only three groupings of job tasks. So we are not talking about occupations, but about detailed job tasks among white collar industry workers. So if you use quite a crude grouping of these job tasks, in this case into three, then we have a decline in job tasks um, done by uh, low-wage workers and an increase in job tasks uh, performed by medium-wage and high-wage workers. If we use a more detailed uh, scale, you see that more is happening. You can no longer point to um, job tasks that are increasing in the middle or only in, in the top of the, uh, of the wage scale or decreasing jobs, uh, job tasks in the low uh, end of the wage scale. You see more variation. And if you go down to job task groups, very small job ta task groups, you see that the pattern varies very much over the wage scale. So there is no systematic pattern that you can point to. You see increases in, in job tasks at almost any wage level and also decreases in job tasks at almost any wage level. But the interesting thing is that the largest changes have very much concentrated to those job tasks which um, uh, cover large groups of white-collar workers. There we see the largest increases, but also very big uh, decreases in, in job tasks. And the, the same pattern is repeated if we look at private sector service workers with <clears throat> more variation occurring when we go down at more detailed levels of job tasks. Um, I would say that uh, this, um, these findings do not contradict what you said earlier uh, in any way. I, I, uh, I, uh, I, um, would say that these rather complement and support the evidence that you provided that uh, this um, change in occupational, in the occupational uh, structure that we see, they are driven by certain occupations or job tasks which are at uh, quite different wage levels. Um, well, this is very brief about uh, a few Finnish results. But then I would like also to, to draw your attention to another aspect of this debate, namely the consequences. Which are the consequences? Uh, whether we talk about job polarization or job upgrading or job downgrading, which are the consequences? Because we see, and we have seen over the past decade, a very strong change in the job market. And of course, these radical changes must have 
um, quite large consequences as well. And this goes for the whole economy level, it goes for the firm level, it goes for the individual level. And we need to know more about these consequences. But so far, to my knowledge, we don't have that much information, research, evidence to, to lean to. For instance, what will happen to employment? What will be the impact of business cycle, cycles in the future? Over, say, over the 10 next years, or 20 or 30 next years, we have some evidence pointing to jobless recovery. But is this true? Does it hold for, for all countries more generally? Or is this, uh, again, a very US phenomenon? We have already heard that inequality is changing. And it, this holds true for wages, and possibly also for incomes more generally defined. But we, so far, we have only indicative evidence. We know that um, wage differences are growing at the top of the wage scale among the high-earning uh, high people, but we know less about what is happening, for instance, among low-earning people. To what extent are their wages changing and their wage differentials changing? What is the role of labor market institutions? We have some indications, but we need to know more about the future and the future role of labor market um, institutions to know what kind of policies we should pursue. But I suppose this is something that will be discussed um, in more detail in, in the afternoon today. Then we have the question of gender segregation and gender wage gaps. Will we see changes also in these dimensions following from this uh, change in, in occupations and, and uh, occupational and job growth. And the educational system. What will be the role of youth education? What will be the role of adult education in this context? What will be the, the role of active labor market policies in this new context? We don't actually know, even though these are very important questions. We have some indications of mismatch and bumping down among university graduates, but the evidence is so far very contradictory and um, quite scarce. And then I have also thought about um, the, the last line on this slide, namely, we see uh, tendencies of polarization, especially in Great Britain and the US, when we use um, median wages of occupations as the measure, the scale. But if we use education, educational level as the scale, then job growth, occupational growth, or, or job change, occupational change in the labor market looks quite different. What is the reason? Why do we get different results depending on whether we use wages or educational degrees as the scale measure? What is the link? How can we, we uh, explain this uh, different, this um, opposite or contradictory results. And um, then finally a few comments linking to the individual level. Um, one important question I would say is to ask what is happening to those who are in these shrinking, disappearing jobs 
in terms of careers and wages? Where do, do they end up? In the labor market? Will they be unemployed and ultimately marginalized from the labor force, excluded? Um, obviously, some of those who lose their jobs will flow down from higher paid jobs to lower paid jobs. But will this mean also that they, uh, to a larger degree, um, compete with young labor market entrants for these low paid entrant jobs? jobs? We have, again, only some indicative evidence, again, for the U.S., but this is actually happening. Uh, will we see breaks in careers from lower paid jobs up to middle paid jobs and high paid jobs because of shrinking, disappearing, middling jobs? I could continue this list of questions, but uh, I present you only some examples. Um, maybe most of all, at this moment, I'm um, worried about the situation for young people and what will happen to their labor market entrance and their careers in, in this quite um, turbulent area faced in the in the labor market. But as I said, these were only a few thoughts concerning consequences because I think that we, we need not only look into the history and the present state, we also need in, uh, to look more actively into the future and the consequences of what is happening. And um, I hope that at least some of the discussion here today will concern also those questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Rita. Um, we have a little over 20 minutes for questions and discussion now, so um, could I ask Monsieur uh, Daniel Loesch and uh, Gilles Saint Paul to come here on stage? And Rita, could you stay here? as well. So is there first something, would you like to comment each other's presentations or something uh, you heard uh, before today? Yeah, well, I will just make a, a comment uh, actually on uh, bo both presentations. I, I think the, in, it would be maybe uh, more illuminating if we saw something about, uh, uh, about wages, uh, because we saw a lot about employment levels, but then if you don't look at uh, the evolution of wages, it's hard to figure out uh, whether uh, this is due to supply or, or demand, right? Um, so we saw that, you know, unskilled jobs are disappearing. Is it because there are fewer unskilled people out there? Or is it because uh, uh, the structure of demand is, uh, is changing? Um, <clears throat> because, of course, you know, a decile is always 10% of the, of the people, right? So uh, you will always have the 10% lowest paid uh, occupation. Uh, so is it that these 10% are doing something else, uh, or what? Uh, is it they are moving up uh, the skill distribution, so the 10% of uh, five years later are more skilled than before? Um, so, okay, but does not come up. Thank you very much, this is a very useful comment. I would also take advantage and make a comment to your uh, presentation. 
because it is a, an extremely important argument also politically. And uh, the argument, I would uh, uh, resume your argument, is this time is different in the sense of the first half explains people what I had to do over and over. I was a union official to say technology does not replace human work. We have no uh, uh, evidence whatsoever in, since the Industrial Revolution that technology would replace workers, to the contrary. And so uh, Gilles de Sample, uh, showed that for the first half. And then the second half, he made this argument. He said, this time might be different. And I would be strongly skeptical. In the early 90s, Jeremy Rifkin wrote the book, The End of Work. The end of work, that huge success, huge success. And unlike Gilles uh, 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 he he's not a serious economist. He's not a serious economist. He's a journalist to some extent. And uh, at the moment when his book was out, mid 90s, 1995, there were 133 million people in the, in the US American labor force. 2010, there are 155 million people. So 15 years later, almost 20% more people are working. So his his argument was always, this time is different. We have the digital uh, uh, age and so on, and this time will be different. We could have many, many other examples. Mid-19th century, 1850, half of our labor forces in Scandinavia as in Central Europe was agricultural. Today it's 5%. If you would have told these people uh, 150 years later, we need many less people, but all the others are also working, and in very, very different occupations, they would have said, where in, in the world will, will they be working? And likewise, in the 1970s. 1970s, a third was in, in manufacturing. Today, it's less than 20%. And if you would have told people, it's not only industry, not only manufacturing, but also in services, we will not use postal letters anymore, almost, but have everything written electronically. We'll do our banking online, buy our tickets online, and so on. They would have thought, this is over. Now we have to think about how to redistribute the less and less work we have. And what happened is more people are working for Finland, Norway, and so on. I have to, I, I've looked at the figures because that is what people say. We have occupational upgrading, but the, the other people are, are pushed out of the labor market. So, and the reason why I think technology will not replace people is because it's not that the, the very driver of economic growth is not technology per se. It's institutions. I think uh, that uh, Asimoglu and Robinson book makes a very good point. Also to uh, Doma Piketty at the very beginning, it's good institutions with, which uh, give people incentives to invest in education and to try out new things. New things are technology. So technology is not at the very beginning. We've had static societies for uh, thousands of years. It's the Industrial Revolution which changed many things. But before that, GDP per capita was very much stable. Yeah, but I think it's, yeah. No, I mean, well, um, <clears throat> there's a name you didn't mention, which is Malthus. My robot society is a Malthusian society, in the sense that, you know, people do not uh, uh, take off above the subsistence wage because you can, as long as they do, uh, <clears throat> Capitalism <laughs> produces more robots, you know. So, so it's a, it's a Malthusian world where uh, uh, physical reproduction of humans, that you know, in the Malthusian world prevents wages from going up, has been replaced by the production of robots. You know. And so, uh, I agree with you that all these people who moaned about the end of work, they were ignoring one thing, which is uh, says law. Right? Says law says, you know, if you have more supply, you have more demand because all these people who want to work, they have needs. So they are going to create the demand for new labor. Uh, so I guess this was the fallacy behind all these Rifkin uh, arguments. But Malthus, you know, in, Malthus was a good economist, not like Rifkin, and his argument is, uh, is perfectly valid in a purely um, purely neoclassical model. So, so what, if you think of uh, growth in GDP per capita being due to exiting the Malthusian trap uh, through the demographic transition, what do you do if the availability of robots reintroduces a Malthusian trap? That's the question. So I think it could be that this time is different, although, you know, uh, 
I'm not going to write a book uh, <coughs> saying that I see, it's very fashionable to predict what's going to happen in the next 100 years, but I, I will not claim I can do it. Um, and, and, and on your first point, okay, you say, the workforce is going up, you know, everybody is working, but are these people really working? This is the question we should ask, you know. How many people in modern Western societies are really working? They are nominally working. They are going to the office. That's true. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, what are they actually doing at the office? Is it work or is it a bureaucratic way of allocating resources uh, that emerged uh, in order precisely to avoid resources to be concentrated in the hands of, uh, of, of very few? Uh, that, that's, that's an important question. All right. Um, so we're big fans of participatory participatory democracy here so let's take and like take a question from the audience as well Kiitos puhun suomeksi Joo mä voin varmaan aloittaa kääntäjä varten Joo. Kysymys siitä, että väheneekö työpaikat vai ei, niin ainakin Suomessa on varsin pitkään jatkunut tilanne, että työtunnit pysyvät samana. Kuitenkin väestö, työikäinen väestö on kasvanut merkittävästi vuodesta 90, jolloin, jolloin josta asti voi havaita, että muutokset työtuntien määrässä on olleet vähäisiä ja myöskään työaika ei ole lyhentynyt. Ja siitä ihan matemaattisesti seuraa se, että kaikille ei sitten riitä niitä töitä. Eli yksi, yksi olennainen asia on juuri se, että miten, mitä, miten päätetään tuot, tuotanto tuottaa, ketkä pääsee osallisiksi siihen tuotantoon. Ja toinen olennainen on tietysti se, mitä sitten työntekijöille maksetaan, miten se tuotanto jaetaan heille ja muulle kansalle. Tässä näissä erittäin hyvissä alustuksissa ei nyt sitten käsitelty sitä isoa ongelmaa, joka, joka liittyy siihen, että palkkojen ja pääomatulojen osuus on muuttunut sillä tavalla, että meille on syntynyt erittäin vahvat rahamarkkinat, jotka eivät tuota mitään muuta kuin lisää rahaa. Ja tämähän on se keskeinen ongelma, johon työväenliikkeen pitäisi kokonaisuudessaan paneutua. Miten tämä pelkän rahan tuotanto, johon pystyy osallistumaan vain pääoma, suurten pääomien omistajat, niin miten se saataisiin häivytettyä kokonaan tästä tuotannosta niin, että todellakin tuotanto käsittelisi sellaista ihmisille ja yhteiskunnalle tärkeää tuotantoa, eikä näennäistuotantoa. I'm just going to make a brief, a brief comment. Um, if I can rephrase your, your uh, question. Uh, so we have the, the capitalists out there. Uh, and the capitalists, um, <clears throat> they are the ones who drive the production process. There would not be uh, employment if there were no capitalists. Uh, now the problem is that if there is too much inequality, if the return, if, if, if the income of capital becomes too large, or even, you know, the income of capital, the share of capital does not grow, but, you know, skilled labor, very few skilled workers get very high wages, uh, then 
<clears throat> this is not so good for the capitalists because uh, it's going to, to, to harm consumer society at some point. You know, if only very few people have income. Uh, of course, they are going to spend some of it, you know, but um, it's going, it may be problematic. And then you might speculate that uh, the capitalists themselves, uh, maybe this is going back to what I was saying about people doing nothing at the office, uh, the capitalists themselves will find a way to preserve the consumer society by limiting inequality. For example, by having you know, lots of clerical jobs. Well, in the US, you have people who, who open the door in supermarkets. Um, but if you go higher up the distribution of skills, you have skilled people having conferences like here or you know, being paid uh, to do studies that are not read or you know, all sorts of committees. And so you might speculate that in some sense, uh, capitalism finds a way to preserve this, this, um, this consumer society and to prevent inequality from going up. Uh, of course, to do so, you need coordination. You cannot do it in an atomized society of uh, small competing firms, because if you do it and your competitors do not do it, then you die. So, uh, so you, you need these big firms, you know, Microsoft, Google, Nokia, who collude. They, they go to a conference and they ask themselves, what are we going to do with work, you know? Uh, and they might come up with such a solution. All right, we have next question, actually, over here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to Daniel. Uh, it seems to me that um, the quantos are defined on an annual basis. And if so, it's of interest how the wages or wage levels that define the quantos develop. So, to be specific, uh, I would assume that the wage that defines the lower bound of your fifth quantile, the, the highest income earners, that might actually go down. Is, is that the case? Wages are simply used as an indicator to say this is a better job or a worse job. And it gives a hierarchy. And this hierarchy is very intuitive. Typically, uh, farmhands are at the very bottom and the lawyers, medical doc doctors at the top in all the countries I looked at. And this is at the beginning of a, of a period. Now, of course, if textile workers and farmers can go up and lawyers down, I couldn't do what I do. So clearly, one uh, uh, postulate, one premise, which we can look at empirically, is the wage structure of occupations is uh, stable over time. But as uh, Rita Absolut said, we could also take educational levels. And that, so yeah, what are the educational requirements in terms of years for each occupation? It looks a bit different because normally female occupations need more education, get lower wages. But still, the, the, the finding that we find is uh, upgrading, upgrading. Now, as to inequality, that changes very much depending on the country. For instance, Germany is one of the few countries where the, the median, the, 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 the distance between the, the quinta one and the median wage went up. In Britain it didn't, in the US it didn't over the period, but the, there it was the, the, the upper tail wage inequality, which uh, widened. And this is, and here I uh, disagree a bit with my colleague next, it's very much institutions. It's very much what institutions do. If, uh, if you, uh, uh, the, 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 the level of wage inequality, technology and globalization did not help, but the level of wage inequality is mostly determined by, by institutions. We have very different, very similar GDP per capita, similar technology across Western Europe and uh, North America, but levels of inequality are widely different. And so politics is important for educational uh, uh, distribution. Of course, if you have wide gaps, you have wider inequality as in the US. And then, of course, uh, minimum wage, collective bargaining, policies favoring or hindering trade unions, uh, strikes, and so on, uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, 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 policies, this leads to, to more or less, less inequality. And the US went for more. Germany over the last 20 years went for more. Britain in the early 2000s with the minimum wage went for less. So uh, this is uh, up to institutions, to politics. Here, technology globalization for a very similar exposure 
we have very uh, different results. And that means uh, we have wide latitudes still for politics. Yes, just... Uh, uh, just a, a small addition to what you just said, uh, that I, I definitely agree that uh, institutions play a um, crucial role in this context. And you can see it also from uh, these uh, pictures that you showed for the different countries. What is happening at the top of the wage level, the, the high quintiles, is pretty much, it looks pretty much the same when you go from one country to the other. The differences are at, at the lower end of, of uh, the wage scale. Uh, the different concerns, occupations and jobs which are located at the lower end of, of the wage scale. And they are, at that point, come, come in these, all these labor market institutions, education and so on. And they differ across countries, so we see differences in what happens at the lower end of the wage scale among occupations located there. And there is, uh, that is the point where politics, policy goes in. And I think that is the area that should be discussed, especially, particularly, because we can't do very much to what is happening at the top of the wage level. Okay, we're running out of time, so we have time for a couple of more questions, so please be brief. I think there was somewhere here in the middle, was at least one. Uh, it, I think it, you were the first one. All right. okay, thank you. Thank you indeed for a very inspiring morning. I'm Nora Jernefeld from uh, Finnish Centre for Pensions, and my question is about, um, well, if there is going to be this uh, great structural change in the labour markets due to the technological change, then um, uh, how should we take that into account um, uh, in terms of our <laughs> pension policies, because in the uh, previous uh, decades, um, people who have become unemployed due to the structural change have been uh, put into these pension tubes or other, uh, that sort of arrangement. And uh, that's apparently something we can't do again, it seems. Would you want to take uh, several questions together? Otherwise, I'm afraid... That's a good idea, actually. <laughs> frustrates let's take, let's take the second one from here. Thank you. I'm Karin Taivo, and I just came yesterday from the uh, Social Democrat Women's uh, meeting, so I cannot, uh, av I cannot uh, avoid the temptation to come back to the gender issue, which Mrs. Asplund uh, uh, just uh, lightly touched. Upon, I mean, the women's euro, in, at least in Finland, is still about 80% of the, of the men's uh, euro. And particularly looking at um, uh, Professor Oshie's uh, figures, it seemed that the, the, the lower paying jobs are, are uh, women's jobs and the higher paying jobs are, are men's jobs. Do you see a growing, uh, sort of a decreasing euro for women? And, uh, well, I don't know uh, how to pose my question to, uh, to Professor Sam Paul. Uh, maybe you will have women robots and, and male robots, or is there finally a gender equity among uh, robots? Thank you. We're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to hear the answers and end this session. Thank you. Thank you for very, very interesting talks. Uh, I will continue uh, with a question that relates to pension, but um, to relating to <coughs> basic income. I'm Vivan Stolen and I'm part of the Basic Income Earth Network Finland. <coughs> and uh, I, I would like to ask first, what do you think about the basic income as a means of arresting this increasing inequality that we have now? 
And then I was very pleased with this uh, robot society as slaves, which brings us back to the Greek polis. And <clears throat> I think a very central question here now is to detach work and employment. Because when we have the robots that do the work, then we can do work that we find meaningful. So we need to add value and substance to work and not only employment. All right, thank you. Well, here was one as well. <clears throat> um, you, uh, as you, well, I addressed this question to all, all of you, but as you all said during our presentations, we, the world has changed before. Uh, what is perhaps different this time is that is the pace of change. Things are changing much faster, and um, earlier times the Luddites or the containers or uh, the dock workers were opposing it. Uh, this time, when the pace of change is much faster, perhaps uh, the impacts will be held uh, in a wider uh, space of the society. Um, my question is: Do you think uh, is is do you think that the sort of welfare state is better suited to address these uh, challenges in the changing society, so that uh, the change will be tolerated by the, by the larger society? In, in a sense. Thanks. Yeah. Very interesting questions. Two questions uh, ask about labor lamp fallacy. The fallacy, the error, that there is a fixed amount of labor. So that was a fallacy prevalent in Europe in 1980s and 90s with concern to pensions. The idea we have less and less work, so the ones who don't, who get older, lose their job, we need to put them uh, in, on early retirement that gives work for the young. It didn't work. It was very costly. It didn't work because that didn't mean that uh, there was more work for the young because the older went to retirement. And so early retirement may be very good for people because it's very tough on the labor market, but it's not uh, a good uh, macroeconomic policy. What the pension policy now is to, to try to have as many people working as possible for as long as possible, or as close to the retirement age as possible. And that means we need to become much better in uh, re-employment services. Our employment services have still not figured out really what works, even though re-employment uh, is quite high. I've, seen, uh, I've done a study on mass displacement of manufacturing firms in Switzerland. I've seen studies in Finland on that, and it's quite high. It's much higher than one would think. Uh, basic income, personally, I'm not favorable at all. I'm a social democrat and I'm totally against it. I think our welfare states must be generous, but in order to be generous, de they depend on as many people working and contributing to them as possible. And it's not the solution to have 40% of the median wage for everybody, because that means everybody is poor. And if you want to be rich, you have to work. Now we can be quite well off, even though we don't work, if we are unemployed, this, uh, invali uh, on, uh, invalidity, what do you call it, this capacity, benefit, old age and so on. So I don't think it's a solution. Uh, wage gap, it's decreasing but frustratingly slowly so. And it's a good puzzle. It's a puzzle. Why is it that BIM take on jobs, management professions and we still have the wage gap? I think public-private sector disparities play an important role, both in Scandinavia but not only. Uh, that uh, women go to the public sector, men to the private sector, and uh, for higher, higher skill levels, the private sector pays much better. Last point, uh, if we uh, favor technological change, and so creative destruction of jobs, and I think this is an excellent point, we need to have strong welfare states. Otherwise, people will, like the Luddites, uh, uh, protest. If you take away their jobs and don't give them anything in return, they will do everything in their power to make it very difficult to, uh, to, to take away their jobs. So I think to cushion the, 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 the difficulty of, of losing your job because of globalization or technology, we need strong welfare states. Okay. Uh, now, um, all these questions are very interesting and very difficult. Um, now, it's funny because I'm not a social democrat and uh, and uh, I'm uh, more relaxed about the idea of people not working, apparently, than the social democrats themselves. Um, so, uh, 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 indeed, you know, what you called the meaningful work uh, was what the Greeks and Romans were calling leisure, you know. 
In French, uh, the word uh, uh, work is a travail, which comes from the Latin tripalium, which means the pains of delivering children. So, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Um, so, uh, of course, I mean, we could dream of, you know, uh, a place where you are paid to do what you like, uh, but uh, that is not uh, work, in fact. You know, I mean, we, could, we may call it work, but, you know, if you are paid, it's because what you do is useful for somebody else in general. Otherwise, they are not going to pay you for that. Uh, uh, and then going back to my robot's uh, speculation, uh, uh, it makes perfect sense that uh, these unpleasant tasks are made by you know, non-human non uh, non robots. So, um, which leads me, of course, to this basic income thing. Uh, if you have a, of course, there is a huge energy spent on you know, designing the welfare state in a way uh, that people have incentives to work. Um, and I guess it's... Uh, I mean, it's a good thing, it's relevant, but uh, for how long? Uh, uh, we talked about these, you know, people packing uh, groceries in the U.S. Now, you know, if, um, uh, that's a, if this is what's at stake, I mean, if this is what, if what is at stake is to take people out of unemployment in, say, France or Belgium and having them pack groceries instead of being unemployed, um, maybe it's not that a big deal, you know. Uh, of course, it would save some money to the state, which is, uh, which is a good thing. But, um, uh, but, but, but maybe the, all the debate about, you know, disincentives to work at the bottom of the skill distribution is, um, is there is overemphasis on that because we are talking about people who do nothing instead of doing uh, things of little value. Uh, so the social loss from from this is maybe not very not very good, not very large. Sorry. Uh, okay. So um, well then about the gender gap, um, uh, I tend to have uh, opinions on that that are maybe not uh, very politically correct. Uh, first of all. Uh, Every time people talk about the gender gap, they always use the largest possible figure. Okay. So I ran a regression for myself where I put, you know, I didn't try hard. I, I, I threw in occupational dummies, basically. And when you throw in occupational dummies, uh, the gender gap is not 20%. At least in France, it's more like 5%. Um, and Marianne Bertrand, who is... Uh, a woman, uh, woman economist from the University of Chicago, she probably earns more than I do, uh, wrote a paper <coughs> on um, MBA women, um, and she found that, you know, these MBA women earn less than MBA men, essentially because of choices that they have made themselves. So, you know, what's the problem? Uh, <coughs> by law, in uh, most countries, there is no gender gap between a man and a woman in the same position. It's uh, illegal to discriminate. So the gender gap, uh, whatever gender gap you observe, must be due to differences in occupations, etc. Uh, then, of course, th there is this debate about, you know, uh, is that due to discrimination or is that due to um, choices that uh, women themselves make? Um, it's very funny that uh, in, uh, in uh, academia, for example, where everybody is against discrimination um, and uh, virtually everybody is a social democrat, um, everybody thinks that women are discriminated in academia. That is to say, the academic people think that themselves they are discriminating. You know, because if you are appointed or not appointed a professor, then it must be by other professors, you know. It's not, uh, it's not uh, the Iranian mullahs that decide who is a professor at Harvard. It's the other Harvard professors. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm very skeptical about that because at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at the real world, um, 
then you see that there is this thing called uh, households, right? And in fact, you know, if you um, look at an economics textbook, uh, one, uh, you know, economics 101, um, <clears throat> one postulate is that the economy is out there to support households, right? It's not the households that are out there to support the economy. Uh, in fact, you don't need an economy, or you need very little of an economy if you don't have households. This is why in Economics 101, we learned this thing called the utility function, which is uh, increasing in consumption and decreasing in labor. Right? So if you work more, your utility falls. It does not go up. And um, <clears throat> so, of course, you know, somebody has to take care of the household. Uh, if the household is empty, it's not a household. And so for historical reasons, or maybe for deeper reasons than that, it turns out that women were more in the households than men. Actually, prior to uh, the Industrial Revolution, I think both women and men were in the household because there was a lot of you know, in-house agricultural work, homework. And the question is, you know, can you envision an economy without households? where everybody is at the, you know, there is no household, it's just a workplace. I think it's a contradiction, you know, because uh, the economy is there to support households. Uh, and consumption takes place within households. Uh, okay, so this is what I had to, to, to say about the gender gap. I mean, if you want, if I was a feminist, I would not be around chasing a gender gap. I would be trying to find good evidence of discrimination. So show me a woman who has denied a job in favor of a man who is less competent. Then I call this discrimination. I cannot infer anything from the gender gap. I mean, there are plenty of gaps out there. You know, uh, actually, there are, more, there are very severe gaps like tall people earn more and beautiful people earn more and uh, lean people earn more. So, okay. Um, um, as for the welfare state, well, we don't have time, I guess. Um, yeah, we're actually yeah. out of time, so really right, yeah. This. Yeah, I mean, the welfare state, um, uh, well, I guess I already answered that question. Presumably, if technical change becomes catastrophic, like in the robot hypothesis, um, <laughs> you need to figure out, you know, how are people going to make a living if you know, they cannot get more than what a robot costs. Um, I was speculating that you know, the capitalists themselves have some incentives to organize to solve that problem. But if it's not the case, you need some sort of welfare state. And then I suppose you know, the interesting question is, you know, uh, should it be the same welfare state or a different welfare state? Uh, there are two dimensions in which the way we view the welfare state will be challenged. One is education, because you know, if education is useless, you have to change that. And the second thing is this, you know, incentives to work, because if you give people incentives to work, but the work is done by the robots, uh, it's, it becomes irrelevant. So then, then, then the welfare state will take more the form of basic income, okay, and less the form of work-based scheme. very brief comments. We are talking about the ongoing change in occupations and job structures in relation to pensions. That means that uh, we don't expect people to go into unemployment and stay there or go into the pension system. Instead, we need to really reallocate the workforce because while jobs and occupations are shrinking or diminishing or disappearing, there are also jobs and occupations which are growing and we create new jobs, new types of jobs, new occupations. And that was the reason why I tried to emphasize that um, the ongoing change also challenges adult education and active labor market policies, we need to also reorganize those. 
When it comes to gender, I was not talking about the gender gap per se. I was talking about the question, how is the change, the ongoing change in occupations and job structures eventually affecting gender wage gaps, gender segregation, the allocation of men and women in the labor market, in the, lab, uh, in the labor force. And um, to that extent, I would like to, to inform you that uh, we will have a publication on this matter for Finland, and it will um, appear um, in late December, early January at the latest. So we really will have fresh results for Finland on how these occupational and job changes are affecting um, the male-female uh, differences in the labor market. All right, thank you so much. Let's give our speakers one more round of applause. And because we're um, running a little bit late right now, so let's start the second st session at 12.40. So it's time for lunch right now. Thank you. 12.40.